Thank you for tuning in to my story. This is the time when we speak and share and chat with people who have had an experience of an extraordinary God. He's become real to them. He's entered their lives in such a way that their lives have been dramatically changed. And now I'm meeting Aubrey all the way from Dundalk, but he also comes from South Africa, which is special because we uh, have learned to appreciate the gifts that God sends to us from South Africa. Yes. Aubrey, your name, Aubrey Morris, almost a British name, isn't it? <laughs> probably Welsh, British, probably, yeah. Uh, goes way back to a great, great grandparent um, uh, who married um, an African woman, so comes from that line. Oh, well, it's good to have you mm. come all the way from Durban. Let's go back a little bit and uh, start with your life in South Africa. I know you're at the moment in Newry as an assistant pastor and that you teach and um, involved in education. But you came from a family of 12, complete poverty. Yes. Um, no Christian background whatsoever. Just tell us a little bit because people don't really understand poverty here, do they? Probably no, no. It's a different uh, place to be. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a family of 12 kids and two parents, and we grew up in a two-room house. Yeah. So you can understand what it means. It means sleep, finding every floor space to uh, put your head down. So it was quite difficult. You know, parents were um, hardworking, but obviously, um, didn't have the well-paying jobs, you know, and, and so as a big family, it was hard to manage us. Mm, sure. And so, you know, you, you depended on hand-me-downs. Um, there were times of sporadic um, success, but it was limited, you know. We were limited in what we could do as a family and as kids. And so we, we found creative ways to make toys and, and, and play and do things because we couldn't afford them, right. you know. And, and, it, and, and it, not just toys, but it came down to, you know, um, survival in terms of food, you know, where the times you'd go hungry because there was no food. So it's not even just not having a cell phone or a bicycle. Um, so this was abject poverty. We really struggled as a family. Um, Tell us then how you began to, uh, you obviously had some talent at school. You were teachable. <laughs> yes. Uh, even though you were perhaps a little bit rebellious too. Yes. <laughs> um, but you, you went on to go to university. Just uh, give us a little bit of the picture of the kind of person you were from, you know, your school uh, and then moving on to university. Mm. Just what sort of background? I was quite optimistic person, even though I, I knew the limitations of my family and my life, you know, and I always wondered what I would do with my life, you know, knowing that there was no money to further my education and things like that. I was at school, of course, and I was quite a diligent student at school, hardworking. Um, of course, I had friends, and there was also wrong influences, and I got into things I shouldn't have got into, you know, uh, growing up uh, through my schooling life when I was in high school, and getting on involved in drugs and things like that, and, and, and parties. But um, at the same time, I, I was a hardworking student, and I wanted to achieve, I wanted to get somewhere. But I knew my parents couldn't afford to send me beyond high school into tertiary education. And so it worried me and it bothered me because I wanted to make something of my life. So how did you get um, a grant that enabled you to go to university? Funny enough, uh, Mrs. Goss, I, I can remember this wonderful lady. She was the secretary of the school and she called me one day and said to me, this was my final year of school. She said, Aubrey, what are you doing <coughs> with your life after school? I said, I don't know. She says, you need to know. I said, I don't have money to study. She said, come and see me next week. When I came to see her next week, she made me sign some forms. She says, give me two weeks and we'll see what we can do for you. Within two weeks, she called me back and said, Aubrey, you can study. I have organized a study grant for you. That must have been wonderful. a <laughs> tremendous blessing to it you. Was. Did, uh, yeah. Do you feel that, that was a gift from God? Or, or at that time, how did, you, how did you feel for the provision of it? I believe it was a gift from God. Even though I did not know God at that time, I wasn't a Christian, but... The way it worked out, you know, someone was looking after me, someone was looking out for me. You know, I did not know where to look, where to turn, who to ask for help. And she 
she must have seen something in me, you know, through the years at school. So um, you went invest. to university and uh, became a normal student, quote. <laughs> what was that? No. Um, I went to Edgewood University after school um, to study, to become a teacher. I went into education. Um, so along the way, I studied psychology and all those things as well. Um, and it was wonderful, a great experience, a wonderful experience um, in my family because I was actually the first one um, of the boys in my family to go to university and complete. Uh, my sister had gone to university as well, my older sister, and become a teacher before me. And that also inspired me, you know, to, to go into that field. Yes. Um, at about the age of 19, uh, you got a bit involved in drugs and drink and wrong sort of life. Yes. What turned your life around? Well, you know, doing drugs and uh, having the bad influences in life, at some at, at a point in life, I realized that I didn't want to waste my life. I wanted something better, you know. And so the issue I had was that it wasn't just my friends who were doing drugs. Some of my siblings, my brothers were involved as well. So the influence wasn't out there. It was right in my own backyard, in my own my family. And, and, and so I wanted to stop it. I, I didn't want to continue. Mm -hmm. And I started searching. And I knew I was empty. Something was missing. You know, the drugs didn't do it. They did it for a while, but when you were done with them, you were back down, back low, back empty. Usually yeah. more empty than when more you started. Empty. <laughs> so how did um, you hear about the Christian gospel? Because up to this stage, I don't think you had a lot of Christian influence at all. Did you? Not really. Just my granny who went to church and would speak about God, but still it made no sense. You know, I didn't catch it. I just knew that she was a person who was close to God and she loved me very much. We were very close, but still I was not aware of Jesus. If you said Jesus to me back then, I didn't know who he was. And that's, did, that's did, the reality. Did uh, your brother or someone bring a teacher back to your home and uh, who had something different about him? Yes, Pastor Wayne, a wonderful man of God. Um, my brother brought him home because he used to run a prayer group at school. He was a teacher in the school at the time, many years back. And my brother would go to the group and I didn't even realize that I was at university, my first year in university oh, so at this, this was time. in the, yeah. his primary so school? So he was in high school. High school yeah. you know, I had left high school and gone to university. Yes. And he would talk about this man, this teacher. And I remembered the teacher because at, back sc at school he was my grade 11 teacher, maths teacher. And he brought him to the house. And when he brought him to the house, they came with a group of believers. And they, you know, they sang and they worshipped God and they gave us the word and they encouraged us as a family. A lot of what they said, you know, was strange to me, but there was something about these people that was genuine and wonderful and magnetic. You know, they were happy, they were full of joy, they were at peace. And I realized that I wanted what they had, but I didn't know how to get it. And so it was only three months later, you know, God chasing me down, I believe, <laughs> um, that I went and found this teacher in school. I went back to the high school I, I went to. And when I went into the foyer, to go to the secretary to ask for him. I saw him coming down the stairs into the foyer and I went straight to him and I said, um, at the time I called him Mr. Thring and I said, Mr. Thring, please, I need God. I, I want God, Jesus in my life. And he right there laid his hands on me and prayed for me. And I believe at that moment I got born again because the weight left, the emptiness left and I just felt God fill me. And it was wonderful. I went away there skipping, happy, joyful, you know. This is great. So we, you were able to kind of, uh, in the expression of an old hymn, you know, you really just felt your, your sins had gone. My you sins had gone. I've been set free. Yeah. And the thing I was looking for had happened to me. Yeah. You know, the one I was looking for, I should say, Jesus. But then you'd been taking drugs and you'd been involved in drinks and other things. Uh, how long did it take you to get released from those things? A lot of the other stuff, you know, fell away, the cursing fell away, you know, the, the anger issue was a problem, I still had that, and the drug issue stayed with me for a few months. I struggled with that because um, I had brothers who were into it and they weren't born again. I was the only one born again at the time in the family of, uh, of 12 and, and, my par and my parents. And so I had to face the mockings, you know, um, 
and, and different things from my siblings. Not all of them, but some of them, because they thought it was a joke, you know, me becoming a Christian and becoming a softy, as they would yeah. say, you know. But um, one day God just delivered me from yeah. it. You know, one day I took it through, I flushed all the stuff, and I said, mm. no more. Yeah. And from that day I walked away from the drugs, didn't have a desire for it again. So you said you had to deal with the issue of anger and uh, there was real resentment about poverty and so on? Yes, uh, you know, I, I felt cheated, I felt I had not got a good start in life, you know, in terms of things I wanted and I felt I was trying to play catch up, to, you know, people who had it all, you know, who had the money, who had, were fortunate. And so I had that issue and the poverty, you know, was there and I was trying to come out of it, you know, because my parents couldn't help me per se and everything I did I had to do on my own, you know, even in turn I had to look after my family at times and provide for them, you know, even when I was at a university because I used to get a grant and I used to use some of the money to help my family. Yeah. When I started working as a, as a teacher I would do the same thing. Um, but the anger stayed with me, you know, right up into my marriage. Right. You. Uh, went back to your university and uh, obviously you still had the same friends or you had uh, the same group. Yes. Uh, what was their reaction to this changed man? <laughs> some of them welcomed it, some of them celebrated it, but I remember this, uh, a few people and this particular girl said to me, she looked at me and she said, you a Christian? She says, I don't believe this, I want to see it for myself. And she said, just give it a few months, you'll be the Aubrey I know. And so I knew something had happened to me. And so through the months, through the years, she came back and said to me, you know what, I really believe God has touched your life. You know what, yeah. and you've inspired me and I'm so thinking of becoming a Christian myself. That's what this girl said to me. Yeah. We were watching my life and seeing what God had done with my life and she realized it was genuine, that yeah. God was real. Praise God. Um, when, at what stage did you start modeling? Modeling, well, my first year at university, um, we had scouts come from the modeling agency and so when we had our freshman ball at university they came to it and so they picked out the people they thought had the edge if you like <laughs> for TV and modeling and all that stuff and so um, they gave me a form and said congratulations you've uh, been awarded a free modeling course at Boss Model Agency in Durban and so I took it up and I enjoyed it, it was good, you know, I learned a lot of things, got involved with modeling, you know, on the catwalk, of course, and, um, you know, fashion modeling and catalog, got so in a few magazines. this is where you get your great <laughs> courage and uh, charisma. Charisma from, and I, I remember doing a TV ad, a casting for a TV ad with Castaway Agency, and um, I, got, yeah, I got the role and I did the ad, it was on television, and it was great getting a bit of money and, you know, and getting involved with um, the modeling agency and with producers and different things like that and was thrilling, you know. Um, and so did you carry that on into the period when you were a teacher? I did, I carried it on for a while, and, but what I found was there were other things that God wanted to do with me, and so I was limited in all the things I could do, and so I shelved the modeling for a period of time and became sporadic, you know. Just so you're now not going to do a Beckham on us now? <laughs> you start modeling here. Funny enough, um, I, I love media, I love TV, I love plays, I love acting. You know, I used to write my own plays at school and at church back home. And it hasn't left me, the desires are still in there. One day, who knows, God might do something with it. You were teaching in a primary school in uh, Eddington. Eddington Primary in Durban. And uh, then you went on to a Christian school. You enjoy music and uh, sport, I gather. I do, I do. I, um, I remember my first school, um, Eddington Primary. I used to run a choir there, a children's choir. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a musician, I play guitar. Um, I also started up a group called the ACC, the Eddington Christian Club Group. And when we saw hundreds of kids come to the Lord, go on camps with us, we would take them away. And I remember um, it was wonderful. We had four born-again teachers at the secular school who ran the club with me. Yes. And week in, week out, we'd see between 150 and 200 kids show up 
for the meetings. Mm -hmm. And God was just doing something wonderful with the, young, with the young kids. They would go home and tell their parents about everything. And some of their parents got born again and came to the church that was run in the school. And we'd go on camps. We'd actually had to turn kids away from the camp because there were too many. Right. And so uh, it was just a buzz. It was wonderful. And I really enjoyed it. You know, and I felt God calling me to minister a lot to young people. And, and I still really do. that still continues, doesn't yeah. it? So what brought you to the UK or to Ireland, I should say? Well, from Eddington, I went to a school called His Church School under Esther Botha was the principal and uh, Fiona Desfontaine was a senior pastor. His Church uh, School brilliant church, brilliant school. I, I, I worked there for four years and I headed up the sports department and that's where the sporting comes out because I, I, I was a sprinter in my younger days and um, won most of the races and so I love sport, you know, football as well as, as athletics. And so I headed up athletics and I headed up uh, football at the school and in the close of four years I felt God calling me to, to Europe, to Ireland and I remember him giving me a vision about it. And I woke up one day and told my wife, I believe we're going to be heading away to a different country. And she said to me, okay. You know, and we prayed about it. And then four months later, I was in Ireland. Um, what made you choose Ireland? I had four brothers here, or three brothers here rather, at the time. And there's four of us now. And my one brother's late at the moment. He passed away. But they had said to me, they did not know that God had spoken to me to come. And they had said to me, would you not want to come to Ireland? And I said to them, it's not time. But I knew God had called me and said, you need to go. And but when the time was right, I got on the plane and I was in the country. Yes. And how did you get the job at the Grace School? Or um, The Grace School um, found out that through my brother, Leon, that I was an um, accelerated Christian school teacher, that I understood the ACE system. And so... My CV obviously spoke for itself and with all the, you know, the backing that it had. And so I sent that over and they prayed about it and felt God leading them to um, employ me. And that's how I got into the country to be employed um, at Grace uh, Christian School, which is now called Grasta Christian School. And this is, um, that's obviously the Irish, uh, Irish name, name for Grace, yes. And uh, you've been there for nine years? I've been there for a close of nine years, yes. Yeah. And uh, you're um, still involved in what sport and uh, what, what, what other Yes, I'm subjects? still involved in sport. I run the PE. I'm, you know, I do the athletics. You know, I do everything, basically, the basketball, the football, all the different uh, disciplines of sport mm -hmm. for the school, for the, for the primary section mm -hmm. of the school. I'm, I also am, you know, teach all the different subjects, you know, your maths, your sciences, and all those subjects. Um, and... I also get involved with music from time to time there. Yeah. So, uh, having been at the school for a number of years, you not you obviously went to church um, locally. Yes. And then you felt, or you had a call to become involved in the Newry Christian Newry Centre. Christian Centre. I was at Grace Fellowship for um, a number of years and worked at the school. The school moved and became independent, and I am still with the school. And during that period. I got involved with their Bible school and I did three years of Bible school there mm -hmm. um, and when I graduated from that I then felt God moving me to Newry and I joined Newry Christian Centre for the past two years and I served there as the youth pastor under Pastor Mike Houlihan, a, a wonderful thriving church, a young church of four years and uh, in Newry, uh, the city of Newry and that's where my wife and I and my kids fellowship. My son plays actually plays the drums there for the worship band. Right. Yeah. So I guess the music talent didn't stay with me only passed down to it the kids. It sounds to me that mm. you have um, had a remarkably uh, smooth Christian walk, but uh, I don't think that's absolutely true, is it? No, no. That's the Just good side. Talk about <laughs> the difficult things you know. that you've had to face as a Christian and the challenges mm -hmm. too. A lot of challenges. I, I believe people need to know that when you accept Christ, it's not going to be a bed of roses. You know, he didn't promise us, right. promise us that. But he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He'll be with us right there. And whenever I face challenges, I knew God was with me, mm -hmm. even through the tears. You know, I've, had, I've lost four people in my family, both my parents and my sister. When I was 19, I lost my parents. When I was, when I was 11, my sister was nine and she passed away, you know, to an accident. 
And three years ago, I lost my brother, Leon Morris, who him and I were very close. You know, um, him and I did a lot for God together, you know, and he was the one who was the catalyst for me coming into the country, mm -hmm. you know. And so it was a big blow to me when I lost him. And so those are the downsides of life, you know. But I had to realize that he's absent from this world, but he's with the Lord, and one day I'll see him. And, but the pain is there, obviously, the pain of losing a loved one. Um, I also battled with anger for a long time. And you said earlier on that you brought that into, into your Into my marriage. marriage, you know. So in what way did that manifest itself? It manifested itself, you know, um, in, you know, where, as the Bible says, we ought to be loving and kind to our wives, you know. You know, um, my anger made me harsh at many times towards my wife and you know and vice versa you know and so we both clashed a lot on different issues and i felt myself drawing away from my wife more than building this marriage and i felt myself um resenting my wife through anger and through everything else you know and and, and not understanding her but resenting her and Did you find before you answer the, the the carry on do you find that your involvement in so many things actually meant that you were neglecting perhaps that close mm. relationship? Not really because we both did things together but I found that when we had issues that I found my comfort in other things in keeping myself busy and and so it meant not spending enough time with my wife yes. um, which was wrong and then the enemy was able to use all the at roof you know and, and push us even further apart you know and, and so I had more time for other people and friends and, and my other relationships outside of, of uh, uh, the house with, with, with my sport, with my modeling, with music, you know, and just my friends. And so I, f I found my family time suffering and I found my wife and I fighting more and drifting more apart. And it came to a point where the marriage just broke down completely. And we were facing basically a divorce after much counseling nothing was working and that was a big blow because i was a christian i was doing things for god i was a worship leader at the time you know i was doing a lot of stuff and this really knocked me because i felt that at this point that i couldn't go on with god and that god had no use for me anymore because i really wasn't right you know my marriage was breaking down my life was a mess you know yes I was having uh, uh, thoughts of going back to drugs and stuff like that, you know, and I was fighting a lot of, um, you know, a lot of temptations and different things, you know, uh, my marriage was breaking down and I was beginning to have thoughts of maybe I'd find myself another woman and maybe I'll marry someone else and forget about this marriage. And so all this, I was fighting all of these things, you know, uh, yet God had his hand on me. And one day God said to me while I was driving in tears, you know, driving away from my wife, I hadn't taken all my stuff and left her, and, and, and that was my final, I was gone, you know, and it was just a matter of us signing divorce papers. And at the time she was pregnant with my second child, so that was very hard on her and me, very hard emotionally, yeah. you know, and, and I felt that I was far from God, I felt completely far from God. And I, I heard the Lord say to me, we can fix this, I remembered so clearly in the car, we can fix your marriage. And I turned the car around, and I drove back and got my wife and we went out for coffee and I remember us holding hands and in tears deciding that we are going to build this marriage back up and, 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 and we've done it and it's been close to 10 years now and our marriage has been beautiful and God has really worked and, and rebuilt our marriage from the ash heap, I'd say. Mm. And I want to encourage people who face things as Christians, yes. you know, whether it's a breakdown in marriage or whatever it is. Don't give up, because God's not giving up on you. No, and I would say that my understanding of the Word of God is that it's God first. Yes. Family, Family. second, probably your business next, and then church. church yeah. Because if you can't get it right with God in the home yes. and in your work, you don't get it right with God in the church. Yes. You've had... Um, an opportunity to serve God in all different kinds of way. And one mm. of the latest ways is that you've decided to write a book entitled The Potential of Your Life. Tell us how this came to being. Okay. I, I must say, you know, and, and give credit to, firstly to God for the ability to write the book and to my wife who uh, supported me and, say, and encouraged me daily, how's the book going? 
keep going, are you writing? You know, and she would encourage me to keep going when I felt challenged, you know, to put on hold or I felt challenged financially or finding a publisher and things like that. And she really encouraged me in that. But through my 25 years um, of having the dream of being an author, because I've been dreaming about this for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, with all the experiences and all the knowledge and all the things I've learned, I felt to give something back to society, to the world, that can help people who are dreaming their dreams, who have potential in them and want to become something in life, or are finding life challenging and want to know how to navigate through life circumstances. And I felt that this is the book that will help them to dream again, to believe again in the things that God has for them, and not to die with the potential in you, but live out and, and enjoy life. You know, this book serves to energize people's dreams and goals and visions. I think mm. um, I haven't read it, but I know from my own experience mm. that actually God takes you beyond your uh, present experience yes. and takes you deeper into things. And it's risky. It is. But <laughs> when you take that step, yes. it's fulfilling. Yes. So it's lovely that we've been able to just uh, let people see your book entitled the potential of your life and uh, I'm sure that you'll be able to get this from any good Christian bookshop yes, and online, and online media places, as well. Yeah. So we'll uh, give you some details of that at the yeah. end of the program. We'd like to say thank yeah. you very much Aubrey for sharing your walk with yes. God with us. We're just going to very briefly say to people that are listening, you see a young man who has faced many challenges from poverty to the very present. And he's found that the fulfillment that is real in his life is the knowledge that God loves him and that God is constantly with him. Mm. And that even though he's no more perfect than anyone else, he actually is a child of God who's been redeemed by the precious blood of mm. Jesus, being set free from the bondage of sin yes. and given Amen. the new life, Amen. which makes yeah. such a difference. We yeah. thank you for yeah. joining us, Aubrey, yes. and we thank you for joining us, uh, men and women who are listening to this program. If you want to know more about my story, go to our website. It's www.mystory-transformlives.com. We thank you for listening. We look forward to sharing more testimonies, more new life stories in the coming days.